Uh, I must say, you know, it's one thing to be picked last on the playground for a game of horse, but I expected more from friends. <laughs> I do realize I'm the last man standing between you and lunch, uh, so hopefully this will be worth, worth your while. Uh, so I just want to mention my name is Malik Majumdar. I'm a cardiologist at Mass General, and this project really started, with, uh, the inspiration from this project was from a special patient of mine and a special interaction in the hospital about two and a half years ago. Uh, so, so despite all the progress we've made over the past century, there, there's a tremendous amount of uh, scientific uncertainty in the practice of clinical medicine. In fact, only about 20% of all medical decisions are actually based on high-quality evidence. And according to a study by the Rand Corporation in 2004, about half of all medical decisions are either wrong or suboptimal. So one has to wonder, why don't we leverage our past experiences collectively to inform future clinical decisions? In addition to the scientific uncertainty, there also is a very large evidence practice gap in medicine today. In fact, of the 20% of things that have evidence, only half of them actually get translated to wide-scale adoption into practice. And the time that it takes for things from discovery to translation and adoption is actually unacceptably long, 17 years on average. And part of the, there are many reasons for that, obviously, but one of the reasons may be that there is no point of care tool to actually assess this quality gap, what we call the difference between evidence and clinical practice. So the unmet need that we were trying to address with this project is the lack of access to aggregate and actionable patient data, as well as insights into the variations in care delivery, both of which we think can significantly aid in identifying the gaps in quality and hopefully inform clinical decisions at the point of care in the hospital. So SmartRx is our solution, which is a software engine that enables customizable, real-time, semi-automated querying of the electronic health record. What it really does, the key step, is use, it uses NLP to understand not just the context, but extract information from both structured and unstructured fields, including progress notes, to make such information visible and actionable. Right? So the key, the key steps uh, of the program, the platform, the first and foremost is a web dashboard uh, querying interface. Then secondarily, actually this patient cohort selection, followed by the key component, which is around the search and extraction tool with the NLP, which is customized for each disease process. And a data visualization for the clinician to use at the point of care, the front, front lines. And of course, the final output into a database that can be then be analyzed and, and intervened upon. So this is just a schematic, a systems architecture diagram. Uh, I won't go into this in much detail except to mention that the data types are on the left-hand side, which is not just demographic information. We actually take in laboratory data, medications, outcomes results like readmission data, as well as the mortality data. And then, of course, progress notes, procedural reports, operative notes, and uh, also the unstructured data fields as well. In terms of the NLP tools, we've been very creative about using both open source as well as proprietary NLP engines uh, to leverage those engines for our work. Because the goal here really is around the implementation and deployment of this technology at the front lines of care, uh, in addition to building customizable querying engines. So this is just a little bit of a snapshot, a screenshot of the dashboard that really shows you how easy it is to use for a clinician at the front lines. We just type in, let me use a pointer here, you can type in the disease of interest, and there's a whole dictionary of ICD-10 codes in the back end that can allow you to identify the right disease you want to query. You can do multiple diseases at a time. And then you can actually filter by the different things you want to do, which is around demographic, age, race, gender, as well as laboratory data, medications. And then further on, you can actually filter not just by type, but by ranges. So if you really want to look at a specific lab laboratory range for certain diseases, you can do that. And obviously, for different disease types, you can actually create a custom query pretty fast, as opposed to pre-established queries. And then finally, obviously you want to learn as we go along. So part of the things we did was when you, result, when you get the result, you can actually annotate if the results were actually inaccurate or how to modify them for, for, next, for querying for the next time. Uh, so it saves the queries for future use as well. So with that, let me actually talk about a couple of examples, some really use cases uh, for this. And I'll talk about one at the individual patient level, just like the patient I had in the hospital two years ago. And the second is actually one of the population level, which is more of the quality of care. So in regards to scientific uncertainty, this, is actually, this case is actually very near and dear to my heart. It happens to be a family member of mine. Uh, and I remember driving, driving her to the emergency room at MGH at uh, 1 a.m. Uh, about nine months ago. And it's a non-specific presentation, a 35-year-old female with headache, fevers, and anemia. And the key thing to point out here is, you know, in the hospital, a few days into it, she was diagnosed with a condition called autoimmune hemolytic anemia. 
And what I remember vividly is there was at least two specific instances where there was a lot of discussion and some uncertainties around the uh, road ahead, right, in terms of in therapeutic interventions. One was around transfusions, the question of do we transfuse her or not? And the second was around the use of steroids. And then this ended up getting published in the case records of the, at the New England Journal of Medicine just about a month ago. And what it states is that as a clinical team, we consider treating her with glucocorticoid steroids the standard of care for patients with warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. It turns out, if you look at the literature, and we did, we looked it up, the treatment of hemolytic anemia is still not evidence-based. There is general agreement that corticosteroids represent the first-line treatment for patients with warm antibody-type hemolytic anemia, albeit their use is based on experience rather than evidence. In fact, there is little published information on their effectiveness, and this is not supported by clinical trials. And this is one example there are countless examples like these every single day on the wards where we sort of have uncertainties about which path to take. And we would and really need a tool like this, we think, to help clinicians that frontline care <clears throat> better figure out how best to use past data and past experiences and past treatments to drive current clinical decisions. So flipping uh, the switch here, we talked about another example. I mentioned earlier I'm a cardiologist at MGH. And we have a lot to be proud of as cardiologists, but, but this is not one of them. Uh, this is a case of heart failure, the number one cause of hospitalizations for people over the age of 65 in the US, and also one of the most expensive chronic diseases. It turns out that about 15 to 18 years after the seminal trials were published, a third of the patients still get undertreated or underdosed with life-saving therapies. And this is just in cardiology. And this happens in many, many fields. So there's a massive gap in the therapeutic appropriateness, and I'm talking about underutilization here, but there's equal amount of overutilization of certain therapies as well. So in addition to these two use cases, you know, when we talk about using SmartRx and validating it, there's some really high priority business use cases as well that we believe are amenable to the platform we built. And as a clinical trialist, I can vouch for at least a couple of these. So first and foremost is the quality of care, improving our patients' outcomes. The next, the same platform can be used to actually automate screening for patients for clinical trials. You know, my coordinators spend literally hours or days screening patients in many different clinics uh, for clinical trial eligibility. And I think this tool, which allows for customizable inclusion exclusion criteria in a searchable index to be able to automate that task. Next up is actually automating prior authorization requirements. As most of you know in the audience, the FDA, once it approves a drug or, or, or therapy, uh, most insurance companies use the criteria from the original seminal clinical trial to make the prior auth requirements, and that's a very searchable, queryable index. Uh, and finally, automating registries. You know, at, at this is Mass General, we have over 100 FTEs probably across all departments and divisions, across partners healthcare, who actually manually, for the most part, enter data for registries. So that the platform like this can really automate a number of, the th of these things. So where are we today? So the current status is that the front end interface is actually already built and I showed you some screenshots. The data access to the enterprise data warehouse and the integration is already completed. We're fine tuning our natural language processing algorithms now for at least two original initial use cases. And we have a, hopefully a demo ready in a couple of weeks. Uh, the next steps are really to scale this, right? So to actually be able to validate first and foremost with our clinicians and researchers for use. But the next and most important thing is actually building this really uh, scalable smart and fire interoperable system where they can work across any EMR vendor, not just the one we have at Partners Healthcare. And then obviously to do that, we need some funding to be able to do further product development and validation. So with that, I want to acknowledge, you know, this project, like I said, came out of an interaction with a patient of mine in the wards two years ago and was generally supported by innovation grant at MGH. We want to move this forward with the collaborations from folks at Partners Healthcare as well as Mass General. Thank you very much. And I'll be outside with any questions.